And now, live from Jerusalem, you're listening to Israel Inspired Radio. Here are your hosts, Rabbis Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Israel Inspired on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. This is Jeremy Gimpel. I'm here with Ari Abramowitz, and I have one thing to say. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah Samea. This is the best holiday ever. Ever! I love this holiday. Ever! <laughs> There's something that's just so fun about Hanukkah. What's so fun about Hanukkah? You know, you don't have all of the restrictions of like, you gotta eat matzah, you gotta not move, you gotta not drive. Like, you can do whatever you want. And then at nighttime, the whole family comes together, we light together, we sing together, we get donuts. It's just a fun holiday. It's just the best holiday. I love Hanukkah. You gotta not move? No, you, can't, you like, always throw things like that. In no, there. on Shabbat you like can't drive. You can't go anywhere. Tomorrow you've always been good at like just listing things, and people aren't following the entire list. And you throw <laughs> things in there like you got to not move. No, tomorrow we're going down to a lot for four days. We Airbnb. I don't. What know. holiday can you not? Are you not allowed to move? Shabbat, Yom Kippur. You're not allowed Yom to move Tov. on Shabbat. You can't get in a car and drive. Moving, I meant like going traveling. All right, let's not get lost here. What I'm saying is that Hanukkah is amazing. I love how it falls in the parshas of Yehuda and Yosef. I love what's going on in the world today. In this dark, dark uh, time, the Jews are lighting it up. I just love everything about Hanukkah. On Thursday, our dear friend Yossi Sassen, who's a part of the B'nai Mach Shavah Tovah that, we're, that, that, that we love so much, um, organized this tiul. He's a Madrich Tiulim. He's a tour guide. And he said, all right, we're bringing families together. We're going to go down to one of the caves that literally the Maccabees, the Jews themselves, made during the war of Hanukkah. And I was like, wow, that sounds incredible. My kids are coming. Tehillah's coming. We're going. Awesome. It's Torah-oriented. It's Land of Israel-oriented. It's Hanukkah-oriented. It's fun. It's awesome. We're going. We went to this Tiul, and as I'm driving by, I notice that we're actually going to the place uh, right next to biblical Adulam. And I'm thinking, Adulam, that's just marvelous. What is Adulam? How do we know this place? Well, the story goes as follows. Joseph is sold into slavery. The brothers take responsibility. They don't even know that he's sold into slavery. As far as they're concerned, he's dead. And it breaks Yehuda. Yehuda is devastated so much so that he actually leaves. He like leaves the Jewish people. He leaves God. He leaves the family. He leaves the destiny of the promises of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he goes, it says, Vayered, and he went down, 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 all the way to Adulam. He becomes friends with a Gentile heathen named Chira. He marries a non-Jewish woman. He has children there, and that's it. He's gone. He has, like, left the family, and he's left the destiny. And in that dark, 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 dark place is where Yehuda actually discovers his leadership. And from that place of Adulam, where we were at on the Tiul, Yehuda turns it around and ultimately becomes the leader of all of the tribes and ultimately becomes the father of Mashiach himself. And I find it just so awesome because we're driving down through Emek Ha'elah where David confronts Goliath in the place that his great-great-great-great-grandfather Yehuda was and where he turned it around. And I just learned this beautiful Torah from Rebbe Nachman about Hanukkah. And he says, what is the magic of Hanukkah? What's the spiritual power of Hanukkah? And Rebbe Nachman says, through the mitzvah of Hanukkah, we're able to draw upon ourselves fierceness and holiness in such a manner that we can strengthen ourselves in the service of Hashem constantly. But the main point is to begin anew each time. Meaning you fall down like Yehuda, you make a mistake, you're devastated, you're failing. In Hanukkah, the whole power of the holiday, when you light the candles, is you're able to start again anew. It's a time of tshuva, which is the name Hanukkah stands for. That's the service should always be in a way of training. Every day that we light is actually training us, training us to start again anew, to start again in our service of Hashem. And this is Rabbi Nachman's words. The lights of Hanukkah, each day we add on another candle because each day you start fresh as if doing it 
for the first time. And this way you keep adding and growing in service of Hashem because each day is done with new reinforcement, with a new start, with a new awakening. Every time we add another candle and another candle and more light and more light, and in the darkest time of the year, we add more and more light. And I felt like on this Tiul, uh, Ari, you were there, my family was there, some of my best friends were there. It was just so fun to be walking through history and at the same time touching our destiny because as we were in this cave that the Jews carved out from the chalk caves in order that they would be able to just learn Torah. The Greeks, they didn't want to kill us physically. They wanted to kill us spiritually. And we weren't able to learn Torah in the lengths and the efforts the Jews went to to continue burning the fire of Torah. And then we were talking about the heroism of the Jewish people. And then in comes a bl- a, an entire platoon of IDF soldiers. And then we all started dancing around the cave with modern day Maccabees and like these brand new Jewish children that many of them had just made Aliyah or were just born in Israel. It was just marvelous. And this holiday brings out the best in us because the Jewish people, we are a people that have seen more darkness than any other people in the history of the world. And in that darkness, somehow we've brought more light into the world than any other people in the world. Right, it's it's true, and, and uh, you know sometimes the light can be so strong and so overwhelming that you can't even see it. I know that that's how I feel sometimes in our days that I can go through a day and things like something like that can happen. You can be on that tiul that we were on with Yossi Sausen and and the uh, the Israeli soldiers come in and the children are there and all these new olim are there and we're all dancing. But if your mind is preoccupied and focused on other things, you can't even see or appreciate the overwhelming miracle that we're a part of right now. Because it's really, it's, it's a battle of consciousness. And to me, that actually is the secret of the Hanukkah candles. Because it's one of the only mitzvahs that you're actually not allowed to derive any benefit from. That's the halacha. You're not even allowed to count your coins by the light of the Hanukkah candles. You can't use it for anything other than what to look at. You're allowed to look at it, to meditate on them, to light your candles and just stare at them and literally just look just to change your perspective, to not focus on all the other stuff that usually occupies our mind, but to just see the light. That's true. Every night this week, I've actually fallen asleep to the Hanukkah, to the Hanukkah candles, just staring at them, meditating at them and falling asleep right there. Wow. But uh, but I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, this is something we've discussed before, but it's worth revisiting that what was the really, if we're going to not talk about the miracle of the victory in that war, but the victory of uh, the the miracle of the the oil lasting, it wasn't really a a miracle that lasted eight nights. It was really seven nights. There was enough oil there. For the first day. For the first day. So if we're going to talk about the miraculous oil lasting miracle time, it's the extra seven days. So why do we light Eight days. Oh, there's so many good answers so to this one. So many good answers. Let's hear but, yours. But, uh, I mean, I, I won't say that this is mine. This is one of the beautiful ones that I want to focus on right now, is that the miracle was that they needed eight and they only had enough for one and they bothered lighting. That they bothered even to light that candle. That in this war against the Greek Seleucid Empire, they either, even bothered to fight. That they even went to war against the, the greatest superpower in the world, uh, a band of zealous Kohanim warriors. That's the miracle, is that they even bothered fighting. And, and re- that's part of what we thank Hashem for. When during the al Nisim prayer we say, uh, we thank Hashem for the bravery. The bravery that they showed in that war against the Greek Seleucids, that they, because that bravery is from Hashem as well. I think about living here in this house on this hilltop. Right. A lot of people don't know this, but when we first came out here, we had a dilemma we were facing. Are we going to um, build a fence around our whole place and then have security cameras? Or are we going to invest our very limited financial resources in planting trees and in making the desert blossom and in really planting our roots deep into this place? And we decided, of course, in a uh, unanimous vote that we were going to plant trees and we weren't going to think twice about it. But here I'm living through days and nights and with nothing between me and Seir and Kisan and all of these Arab villages. 
and I have not felt one moment of fear since I've been here. Now, why is that? All I can say is Hashem has made it where I don't feel fear in my heart being in this place at all. Hmm. Not for a moment. But I can't exactly take credit for that because I felt fear at many other points in my life, but being here, for some reason, I just don't. And, uh, and, and, and I can only credit God with, with putting a certain strength in my heart. And why have I not been attacked? Why have we not been attacked? I think it's because... God is putting a certain fear in their hearts. The fear that should be in mine isn't, and maybe it's put into theirs. And they say, who's that guy living in that? Who are those people that are very boldly going out and settling this place? You want me to tell you why I know that Hashem loves us? Why? Because Ishai Fleischer just moved a lot closer to our farm. That's, I know. I know, right? He moved to Efrat. We, I, when I went to pray in the morning in Efrat, because we go and we learn of Shlomo, so I drive in. It's a 15-minute drive. I just found a new ro- route into Efrat, into the Zayit. Did you know about that? No, I didn't know that. It doesn't go, you don't have to drive through Efrat. Really? Yeah, it, it shaves like a good four minutes off the That's trip. That's interesting. Well, the point was... But I go into the Minyan, and Yishai is there. And I said, really? Is this my life right now that I could go and to see Yishai in the morning and Minyan? That's he was always like a little bit like the untouchable guy that you really have to go super out of your way to, yeah, you to got, find him and see like him. Like you have to go to either to Haraz 18 or to Hebron into some war zone. <laughs> <laughs> like the most dangerous places in the world. If you want to see Ishai, that's where you have to go. Uh, it, and it, now he's living in Efrat. It's really... Uh, well, what's so fun about that is over Hanukkah, which means dedication, he hosted a Hanukkah bite, dedicating his new home in Efrat. And he had one of the real founders, one of the leaders of the Hebron Jewish community uh, come because obviously Ishai is the international spokesman for Hebron, and so at his party he had one of uh, one of the real, probably the world's expert on Ma'arata Machpelah on the Tomb of the Patriarchs. He just wrote a book about the Tomb of the Patriarchs. Noam are known, an amazing, amazing individual, and Ishai asked Noam to come up and speak, and he got up and taught all about Hanukkah and all about the wars of the Maccabees and uh, just so much information that I, I really didn't even know the wars that happened just right across the street from Ephrat, the Jewish community called El Azar in the valley right where El Azar is, is where El Azar the Maccabee uh, was killed. In one of you the knew most, that though. I, that part I knew. But there was, I mean, there was just so much information and Ishai like pokes me and he's like, Hanukkah, that's, that's not even his field of expertise, you know? He was just such a, an ilui, just like such a genius. One of the points that he that he draw that was drawn out, which I found particularly meaningful, was he said that the Maccabees had eight massive critical wars with the Greek Empire. And it was in the middle of all of those wars that they actually reclaimed the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. They cleansed it out and they found the the oil and they lit the menorah and it lasted for eight days. But the wars continued and then they lost the temple again. And they continued to have wars. And then eventually the, you know, the Beit Hashmonai, the Hasmonean dynasty, rose up. And then eventually they recaptured the temple once again and they cleansed it again. But when we celebrate Hanukkah, we don't celebrate the end of the war. We celebrate the first time when the miracle of the oil happened. We celebrate in the middle of the war. And to me, I found that I couldn't stop thinking about that as soon as I heard his beautiful drasha, his, his, his beautiful Dvar Torah, his beautiful speech that he gave at Ishai's house. And I was thinking how marvelous the Jewish people are that in the middle of the war, even though the war wasn't done yet, even though many others died in future wars, and we lost the temple again, and once again they brought Avodah Zarah, the idolatry, into our temple, we still celebrated the first victory when we got the temple back. We immediately started celebrating. We immediately lit the candles. We didn't have enough oil. We're going to light it up, and we're going to celebrate then. And so Ari was at my house over Shabbat, and I uh, was talking to Ari. I was like, Ari, what, what, is that, what does that do for you? Because I've been thinking about it and thinking about it. What is it about the Jewish people? Why do you think we celebrated the middle of the war and not the end of the war? Why do you think we did it that way? And Ari, you want to share what you said? Well, I think I, the perspective that I had on it is something that I tried to integrate into our, my consciousness right now, is that when we look back at things... Uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but in some ways it's really not. 
there seemed to be a lot of anticlimactic, very slow acquisitions during that war, and then we lost it, and then we got it from our perspective backwards. It was a gr great miracle. It lasted a bunch of years, and then we won, we won this war, and now we're celebrating that. But at the time, it was so it was really not clear. It seemed very much like it does now that we're in Israel and we conquered Israel. We returned in 1948, then in 1967, and then there's the disengagement from Gaza, and then Jews are ripping each other out of our houses in Amona, and they're destroying houses in Ativa Vot, and there's tremendous waves of secularism, and it seems like it's it's like growing and waning and growing and waning. I, I think the word that really struck me when you spoke about it over Shabbat was like it is dealing with the anticlimax, meaning we expect the Six Day War, Harabai be. Adenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. That's it. Time to celebrate forever and ever. And it's like, what? We gave the Temple Mount back? And now we're struggling with disengagements and we're struggling with all of the terrorism and all of this stuff. And what's going on? No, exactly at that moment, that's Hanukkah for us. I think about that bracha, that blessing that we say, that we've been saying now for 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years. And how marvelous it is in those days, but in our times. Imagine what we're saying. Like we are living and breathing a miracle. If we just had the eyes to see it, Trump's declaration over Jerusalem, a lot of people are poo-pooing it and they're saying, oh, but he's this or he's that and what does it matter? The next president will be something else. And No, folks, something is actually changing in the world today. Something is happening if we just have the eyes to see it that we are living by Yamim Hahem, like in those days, but in our time. Right, and that's, I think, the Maccabees held steadfast to that consciousness, to that awareness during those wars, even though it wasn't clear to the naked eye at the time, very much like the story of Joseph that we're reading through right now. Right? He was thrown into the pit. He was sold into slavery. He was in Potiphar's house. He rose the ranks. He was trusted beyond anyone in the house. And then he's accused of rape when in reality the opposite was the truth, that he overcame this seduction by Potiphar's wife. He's thrown in prison. He's there for years. I mean, what is he thinking after year one and a half? He's still in prison in this deep dungeon in Egypt. Was it clear to him? Did he know what we know now, the whole story of Joseph? No, only in retrospect do we see that beautiful, brilliant story of, of uh, ascension from the bottom. One of my favorite psukim in the Torah, I was just reading through the, uh, through the Parsha, and I read this verse, and it just it stood out to me, and it just gave me hope in life. Right, it says, "Vayishlach paro v'yikrat Yosef v'yaritzu min abor v'yigalach v'yichlaf simlata v'yavo el paro." In one verse, Joseph goes. It says Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he called Joseph, and they rushed him out of the pit, and they shaved him, and they changed his clothes, and they brought him before Pharaoh. All in one verse, Joseph goes from being in the lowest place in the world, a, ver a pit, a prison in Egypt, to standing before the most powerful man on the planet, and becoming the second most powerful man in the entire world. In one verse, Yeshua Hashem Keherafain, right? The salvation of God, it can happen in the blink of an eye. And that's why we have to always remember in our lives when we're going through these ups and downs with this, things seem so, like we're on the verge of how many years? Year after year am I saying, this is it, Jeremy. Mashiach has to come next year. I just know it. And then it just, uh, we're, it's already like a private joke. Like, okay, <laughs> when's it going to happen? Are you? But, but that, what, I'm off by how many years? We're in those days. We're in those times. And the tension is growing so much, and we have to keep in mind when we see these things that, to our naked human myopic perspective, seem like drops. Really, it's it's part of a, a tremendous unfolding. Well, I'll tell you, last year, um, I took the time to read the book of Maccabees during Hanukkah. And um, the, my favorite part of the book, and probably it's everyone's favorite part, whoever's read it, is when they actually call for the rebellion. And they say, Mila Hashem Eli. It says, whoever is for Hashem, come with me. And then they, that's how the rebellion starts. And I'm like, what an epic line. Mila Hashem Eli, whoever is for God is with God. Was that with not me. also 
the call of Moses and the Levites, Moshe and the Levites. That's what makes it so amazing. Like they are, saw themselves as a direct continuation of the same struggle. And what I see that's happening now is Israel is in some ways, even if Netanyahu isn't saying it, it's Mila Hashem Eli right now. And all of the believers are all around the world now. I mean, my goodness, I think next week, or no, in two weeks, we have a group, our first group from China that's coming. And they are just seeking after God. And if we just had the eyes to see it, if we really took the Hanukkah lights seriously, you know, in the mystical writings of Judaism, it says that the Hanukkah lights, this, this mitzvah, is rectifying the sin not only of the spies, that came into Israel and didn't have the eyes to see it. They saw Israel and they could have seen the miraculous. They could have seen the promise. They could have seen the destiny of Israel unfolding. And instead, they saw big walls and that scared them. Where, who was the one that said it? Was it Rashi? Who R- says, Rashi, was Rashi says if they saw big walls, they should have known the people are weak. They need big walls to protect themselves. It was just a matter of perspective. And then we go back to the very first sin of the world. We look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and it says it was a ta'avala enaim it was a lust for the eyes and now in Hanukkah we're going all the way back to the Garden of Eden and we're fixing our eyes we're fixing the way we see things because what are we really supposed to see and this brings us all the way back to Joseph and to Yehuda and I heard this beautiful Torah by Rav Elon Mazur who teaches in Yeshivata Kotel he was uh, he, he taught it to me actually in my home this afternoon and I just want to share it with you Joseph's entire life is led by dreams, and we know that the month of Kislev is the month where we fix our sleep. It's the, it's the darkest time of the year, and according to the Arizal, the month of Kislev is where we're fixing our sleep. And so what do we do when we sleep? We're dreaming. And Joseph is always led by dreams, and we have these, these three pairs of dreams that come to Yosef, Joseph's life. The first two were there are stars bowing down to him. There's wheat that's bowing down to him. And what does Joseph do with those first dreams? He just tells people about them. He just tells his brothers and tells his family. Then the next time he encounters dreams, he is in prison. And he doesn't just tell the dream. This time, he interprets the dream for the ministers of Pharaoh that were thrown into prison. So one time he just tells them, and now he's already interpreting the dreams. And then in the last two dreams he encounters with Pharaoh, what does he do? He doesn't just interpret Pharaoh's dreams with the cows, the big cows, the fat cows, and the thin cows. No, no. He doesn't just interpret it, but he also responds to it. And then think about that. That's a way that Joseph is learning now to relate to God, to relate to his dreams in totally different ways. One way is he just says, listen, I want you all to know there's a dream here. There's a destiny that's going to unfold. It's just going to happen. The next time, he almost becomes a little bit more of an interpreter of that dream. How do we figure this out? I mean, and the next time, he's responding to the dream. He's like, well, this is a dream that's happening. I now have the opportunity to understand the dream and to react accordingly. I now become a real shutaf lima'aseh bereshit. I become a partner in the creation itself through the dreams that God has given me. But then, when his brothers come down, they all bow down to him, except for Binyamin and his father. And it says, and Joseph remembers the dream, Asher Chalam Lam, that he dreamed for them. And then what does he do? The Ramban, Nachmanides, has the most marvelous interpretation. Because Rashi says, hey, he remembered his dream. They're all bowing down to him. And he remembers, hey, my dream has been fulfilled. But the Ramban says, Rashi, I'm sorry. I mean, his dream was that everyone was going to bow down to him. His father's not there and his brother's not there. This can't be the fulfillment of his dream. So then what does Joseph do according to the Ramban? He engineers it. He engineers it. He says, God has given me a dream. Now I become Baal HaChalamot. I become the master, the dream master, where I don't just have a destiny where I just live with faith that the destiny is going to unfold. I have a dream. Now I participate in creating my dream empowered by God. And now let me tell you folks what Hanukkah is all about. Seeing the lights in the darkest time of the year knowing that we are back in Eretz Yisrael. Hashem has given every single one of us a dream. And now, just like Baal HaChalamot, the master of dreams, Joseph, it's up to us to figure out how do we participate in this great dream that's unfolding. How do we engineer our place in this marvelous story? How do we take the next step in the journey? 
Do we see ourselves as modern day Maccabees? Can we say me la Hashem Eli the way the Maccabees said it, the way that Moses said it? That really is our task in these days to not only know that there is a dream that Mashiach will come. The question is, can we become Baal HaChalomot? Can we become the dream master and participate in creating this dream in the darkest time of the year? It's hard for me not to notice also that while you and I and, and, and Roni and Yossi, we have dreams of this place that we're doing. It's not really the dreams at, at night. I know I've dreamt about it, but the story that we've told all of our listeners and the people that have been following us know what we're talking about, about this woman from uh, Switzerland. How did she come to give this massive wave of support that gave an entire wave of energy and growth to this place? It was through a dream. Through a dream. A dream that she had in her sleep from 15 years ago. That the, the dreams that we've had, and you were just telling your story, Jeremy, about you and Tahila. Yeah, it was a few years ago. It was the Saturday night before the new year. And uh, Rav Daniel, our rabbi that we love so much, mm -hmm. was hosting a workshop to prepare us for Rosh Hashanah. And, um, you know, he's playing the clarinet and there's a, a, a percussionist and there's a guitarist. And he says that right now we're standing before Rosh Hashanah. This is the time where God dreamed up the universe that he was about to create before that let there be light moment in that big flash of light that created the universe it was before that we're now standing on saturday night before the new year and now this is an opportune time for us to dream about our upcoming year and i want you all to dream and let it go and so he started playing this beautiful meditative music and i let my dreams go and of course what was i dreaming about I was dreaming about this place and what I wanted it to be and the people that I saw and what I wanted to happen here. And uh, the night was an amazing night, probably the best preparation for Rosh Hashanah I ever had in my life. And I come back and Tehila asks me, like we're like lying in bed, we're about to go to bed. Well, so tell me, what did you dream about? And so I started telling her the dream of this place. And I said, it's going to be a place of Torah. And people from around the world, from all different types of backgrounds, are going to come and learn about Israel and learn about Judaism and learn Torah and celebrate Shabbat together with us. And they're going to work the fields and we're going to eat of the fruits of our labor. And we're going to raise our children in this marvelous place. And as I continue to go, Tehillah jumps out of bed runs into the baby room, which is right attached to our bedroom. I hear books falling off the, the shelf. The baby wakes up. I'm like, what is Tahila doing? She pulls out her diary from when she was 18 years old, something that she hadn't looked at in I don't even know how long. And she's like, I totally forgot about this dream. But I want you to know the dream that you just told me. I had this dream a long time ago, and she handed me her diary from on her 18th birthday. She had a dream, and I opened up her diary, and I read the exact words that I had just articulated to her. She had already had a dream before I even knew her. I married her when she was almost 20, and this happened on her 18th birthday. And at the very end, it says, I don't know how I'm going to get there, and I don't know how it'll happen, I'll need a partner to help me make it happen, but I just know that that is what Hashem wants for me in my life. And so everyone needs to know that Hashem has a dream for all of us, and this is the time to connect to the light, to connect to Joseph and Yehuda, and know that the dreams that Hashem has for us are inside us, and we have the power to become Baal HaChalamot, to be the dream master and engineer the dreams that God has for each and every one of us. Friends, happy Hanukkah, Shavua Tov, Chodesh Tov very soon. Shalom from the hills of Judea. Light one candle for the Maccabee children. Hi, this is Josh Haston, host of Israel Uncensored. And on behalf of all of the show hosts here, we want to wish our listeners all over the world a happy Hanukkah. 
and all the best from Jerusalem. Happy holidays from the team here at thelandofisrael.com.